I'm Lyle Gibson, author, historian, filmmaker. In 2019, I, along with Jaquay Valentine, produced the first three of a multi-part film series entitled An American Story. In part four, we will explore the history of the Church of God in Christ through the lens of Bishop Charles Harrison Mason, Overseer David Johnson Young, and Bishop Charles Plez. The purpose of this film is to examine the role of the Church of God in Christ within the greater context of American history and the history of the holiness movement. Charles Harrison Mason, a, a rare, extraordinary human being um, whose life is somewhat of a um, microcosm of the holiness Pentecostal movement. He was born as a slave, um, right at the conclusion of the Civil War. And from those beginnings on a farm, a plantation in Tennessee, um, to come from that a yearning, a yearning to have an understanding of his world, of his culture, and to align his spiritual experience with the harsh, limiting, oppressive environment that he was thrust into right out of slavery. According to his daughter, his father, Jerry, was shot down before his very eyes on the plantation in which he worked because there were um, Confederate sympathizers who had marauding groups that were continually traveling throughout the South with the hope of restoking the Civil War. News accounts show that Jerry Mason and his wife Eliza were called to testify in court regarding the destruction of ballots after a recent congressional election. During the 1891 trial, Jerry and Eliza Mason were going against white leaders in their grasp for power rooted in the old Confederacy. It was ruled that Jerry had perjured himself and was confined to a Conway County jail. At some point, Jerry Mason escaped. However, he was apprehended in Indian territory only to face his demise. And for his search for truth, his search for an experience with God, his search for understanding um, caused him to see that his current religious structure was woefully inadequate for his spiritual hunger and the hunger of other of his fellows and to address the oppressive racist world in which the norm had greeted him. So from that spiritual hunger and intellectual dissatisfaction, Charles Harrison Mason um, became attracted to the doctrine of sanctification. He wasn't looking for that term, but that was the terminology that defined where he was, to know that the gospel of the scriptures should be experienced, not just a organizational uh, um, connection, but to be experienced, and that the scriptures gave both a rationale as well as a record of how one can actually have a Holy Spirit encounter that transforms their personal life. And from that, that a church should be reformed. If we really want to talk about the holiness movement, we want to go back as far as the late 1700s. And we want to deal with John Wesley, who was a central figure, um, who many would say actually was the father of the holiness movement, even though he was from England. 
Um, he came to the Americas and he ran revival here. And um, his doctrine was very different from any other doctrine that was really being taught at the time. Um, um, John Wesley emphasized what we call Christian perfection, a doctrine of Christian perfection. And he believed in entire sanctification, which is where a person is sanctified or separated from worldly living, worldly lifestyle, unto a really holy um, living and consecration to God. He also emphasized love as an important aspect of that doctrine and holy living. John Wesley, founder of Methodism, was born in 1703. He preached the doctrine of sanctification. Sanctification is God's reserved purpose for our lives, distinguished and set apart. This belief in sanctification is rooted in the New Testament scripture of 2 Thessalonians 3 and 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth. Additionally, John Wesley used his platform to speak against slavery. As an abolitionist, he openly denounced the institution of slavery. He believed that liberty was the right of every human being. John Wesley's legacy continued to the early part of the 19th century. The adherence to Christian holiness, sanctification, perfect love, secured through God's Holy Spirit. This legacy would be part of the lasting foundation from the Palmer Sisters, Amanda Berry Smith, William Seymour, and the Azusa Street Revival. This was one of the few organizations before Azusa that was already structured, functioning, and productive. So the Church of God in Christ was officially organized in 1896. And then the Azusa Street Revival broke out in 1906, 1907. So there were 10 years of history where the Church of God in Christ existed as a holiness church before Azusa. And so as this group of Baptists, Methodists, no denomination, other representations, as they began to uh, come together, they saw the need to have some formal organization because that began to shift as the holiness experience began to um, expand. They were ejected from their churches the churches were sometimes severed from the association um, that they were affiliated with. So they felt the need to organize. And so by the time you get to 1895, 1896, you have the names of um, C.P. Jones and Pleasant and Jeter. Um, you have the names of um, Roberts, Abel, Welch, um, C.H. Mason, uh, D.J. Young. These were the persons that came together after being um, evicted from their churches to form what became known as the Church of God and later on the Church of God in Christ. To have the kind of support, the fellowship, the freedom, the encouragement, and also the effect of their collaborative identity to help share this experience across the South at that time, leading up to 1906. So uh, my way is the new way, oh, yeah. and as far as the east it is from the west, oh, yeah. so are my thoughts from your thoughts. Oh, yeah. The journey of Pentecostalism from Tennessee to Kansas, an American story.